Before we get going, listeners, just a reminder, it's nearly Christmas time. You're welcome, 25th of December, not far away. More importantly, you don't have long to get 43% off the cover price of a subscription to The Week magazine. You can get it really simply by just putting the words Pod Xmas in at the checkout when you subscribe, which means if you haven't bought someone a Christmas present yet, do this now. It's a winner. Give someone the gift of The Week magazine every week. Just visit dennismags.co.uk slash the week and enter the code PODXMAS to get up to 43% off. And now on with the show ho ho. It's the week ending Saturday the 22nd of December and this is The Week Unwrapped, brought to you by Barclays Corporate Banking. In the past seven days, we've seen Trump's shock decision to withdraw US troops from Syria, yet another delay in the Grenfell inquiry and one of Britain's biggest airports grind to a halt because of a drone. But we're here to bring you some of the stories that passed under the radar this week. Big news, not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all our lives. I'm Ollie Mann, and let's unwrap the week. And joining me from the week's digital team this week are Cameron Tate, Jamie Timpson, and from the week junior, Felicity Capon. And starting the show this week is Cameron. A rare show opener for you. Uh, What do you think this week should be remembered for? Well, it seems like Tumblr is kicking off its New Year's resolution early. Meanwhile, it's just been announced that the website Tumblr will be banning porn starting on December 17th. And if you do not know what Tumblr is, you have until December 17th to find out. Because banned content includes photos, videos, and gifs of human genitalia. Which I think means that memes of human genitalia are still okay. That was a clip from The Late Show with Stephen Colbert aired earlier this month. And so, Cameron, this has happened now. Tumblr has banned porn. It has. Since Monday, Monday the 17th, uh, Tumblr has moved to ban all porn, which is any images, videos, or, as Stephen puts, GIFs, pronounced properly, (laughs) depicting uh, real-life human genitals or female-presenting nipples. And so what? I mean, I get there's lots of people, millions of people, for whom Tumblr was their preferred destination for pornography, but it's not as if there aren't many other rivals out there. So why is this significant? And that's actually Tumblr's case. When they came out and announced this uh, a couple of weeks ago, Tumblr actually said, look, you've got lots of places to go and view porn. You don't need to come to our platform to do it. But what the move has done is it's kind of sparked a bit of a backlash among smaller communities that were using Tumblr as a safe place in which they described they could express themselves, which you can't really do on a conventional porn website. So that that's things like Felicity basically curating whatever kink it is that you're into. You know, it might not be your content, but you say, I'm particularly into when someone strokes the heel of their shoe during sex and I'm going to find 10 videos that portray that. Yeah, precisely. It was social media porn. So um, there was a great article in Cosmopolitan a while ago about why a lot of women in particular were sort of drawn to it for its more feminist, more empowering porn content, more tailor-made, more social porn for a social media age. And I think actually Tumblr's sort of excuse or justification that you can find porn elsewhere was a totally fatuous bogus argument because actually porn elsewhere on the internet as we all know is getting far more violent far more misogynistic far more a lot a lot darker basically and, and it's the idea was curated by one company isn't yeah, it all exactly. the big porn video sites exactly. are owned by one company and um, you only have to look at documentaries such as hot girls wanted to know that porn in its sort of traditional sense was getting really really dark and ugly and actually a lot of people were drawn to tumblr because it was people were more free to curate it how they wanted it to be and that's why there has been such an outcry over tumblr's decision to do this okay but the reason that they've done it cam is because it's uncomfortable for yahoo the parent company isn't it to be running tumblr as a place where they can sell advertising and say that they do news stories and all these sorts of things when at the same time you know there are microblogs on tumblr containing images that portray people who might be underage, images that come from who knows where, they don't even know who's being depicted. You know, it's, it can be a bit of a wild west. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, the big thing that kicked this all off essentially was uh, at the end of November, Apple took the Tumblr app off its app store. They didn't explain why, but sources claim that it was because there were uh, indecent images of children on the on the platform. So this isn't an, an issue that is exclusive to Tumblr. Loads of image sharing websites have it. But what a lot of companies are able to do is invest in systems that can hunt out the indecent images, remove them without 
taking down legal pictures. So what the problem that people have with Tumblr is they've just done a sweeping ban on everything showing nudity essentially, uh, which a lot of people are calling lazy. With some amusing exceptions, do you have those at your fingertips? Yeah, I do. Yeah, Apparently there are uh, pictures of turtles, puppies as well. Stop, uh, stop. It's a family podcast. I know, I know. No, but puppies terrible. and turtles are allowed. They were taken down by mistake. They were taken but down But there is by some, mistake, what yeah. I meant was, there are some um, exceptions of nudity you're allowed to portray, aren't there? Oh, yes, there are. Breastfeeding. Yeah. Breastfeeding's fine, and any art that depicts art, you know, art and so, so, like painting also, or... Post-operative nipples are okay, yeah. but nipples aren't generally. I think the, the main thing that I found just so bonkers about it was that Jason Momoa's, so Jason Momoa's an actor, there's a picture of him rising out from the swimming pool where he admittedly does look good mm. but it's highly sexualized it's a highly sexualized image he has his top off his nipples are on display but they are not female presenting nipples and so therefore tumblr has accepted that as something that's acceptable on the platform whereas female presenting nipples is too is too much and i think from my perspective i think the sad thing about the the issue is that it is a trend of painting adult content as harmful and unsafe and unwelcome and i think actually really that's quite insulting to a lot of people i believe that we should be more sex positive and this is a move towards the a kind of more conservative end okay well there's someone in the room who works in children's media so i'm going to ask her opinion on this felicity is this a case, as Jamie is suggesting, that this is a company saying you shouldn't be allowed to express yourself sexually on a mainstream platform, which would seem a shame? Or is it the very availability of this material to children that poses the particular problem? Because Tumblr have had years to deal with this, but the bottom line is if you type certain sexual kinks into Google, it directs you immediately to hardcore images on Tumblr. Children were mm. able to access mm. that. And that shouldn't be something that a mainstream news platform provides. No, absolutely not. And I think the, you know, child pornography on the internet and adults looking to exploit children and... But, but even children viewing adult Yes, materials. exactly. All of the above, I think, is a, a serious consideration. However, as you said, this isn't something that's new. So I think it's suspicious that Tumblr is sort of taking action now. And I, I would hazard a guess it's something to do with ad revenues. But I think, I think the problem is very real. And obviously, we'd all rather live in a world when people weren't targeting children on the, on the internet or there, was, there wasn't there was unsafe content for children. But actually, I guess there is the argument that wouldn't you rather it was, if, if it does exist, wouldn't you rather it was exposed on something like Tumblr, where more people can see it and hunt down the offending people or get rid of it quicker than if it was if it just goes onto the dark web and you find it there instead. So Okay, but we're talking about two different things. Child abuse imagery is different, but mm -hmm. I'm talking about the availability of, if you like, mainstream well, pornographic would... images to underage people. That's something that Tumblr could have cracked down on much harder. Yeah, but I mean, if you, the way you were putting it is, you know, a, a child could go on to Google and type something in of, of, of a sexual nature and then find it immediate, immediately on Tumblr, but they would also have loads of other results that they could go and get it from. Yes, like, but the other results yeah. aren't trying to have a business model that involves selling apps through Apple and selling adverts I, to I would, the New York I Times would, and whatever. I would probably posit that actually people should take more of an engagement on what their children are looking for and what they're watching. And if you do, as a parent, want to filter the Im the imagery and the, stu and the stuff that your child's looking for, I agree that it's something that we don't want to happen. But the fact is, is that Tumblr for a long time has been known as this, like... Mm -hmm business in the front, party in the back type of model of, of yeah, a company. And it seems to be very much shooting itself in the foot. It's a social media platform that clearly doesn't understand what its users want and why, they're being, why it's been so popular mm. thus far. So it seems like a really b bizarre decision for Tumblr to make. But I also wonder whether it is a kind of example maybe of more puritanical views creeping in when it comes to sex and proclivities and that sort of thing. It made me think of Manchester Art Gallery earlier this year be, uh, removing Waterhouse's Hylas and the Nymphs painting because it was, it's a depiction of these very young, naked nymphs. And they took down this painting and, and they said, you know, we need to have a discussion about whether this kind of nudity is should be visible in public spaces, which was just so interesting that that even happened. And I wonder whether we're slightly moving towards a society where maybe because of Me Too, we're suddenly questioning any kind of nudity and whether, it, you know, whether it's OK to have that in a visible space. I mean, Cameron, why is it your story of the week? Why is this the most important thing happening right now? The reason is, is I, th I think, going off the back of what Felicity said it, it's, it's that kind of, it almost seems like we're eking back to these very conservative values that the human form the naked human form is is not good and we shouldn't see it and the porn ban was, was very interesting because obviously it, it brought a lot of these forward it's the first time I've ever seen something like a porn ban on the internet where a lot of people have come out and said that it's a really bad idea the, the kind of the main issue here is, is among 
the smaller communities, particularly the LGBT community. They use the platform not necessarily to post nudity for arousal, but as a way of kind of exploring one's identity. So is there still a niche for Tumblr, do you think? Not in its current form. I, I, there's been huge moves by the communities to move over to other things. One idea was to create a new version of, of it called Cumbler, which I thought was quite amusing. No, you've answered a different <laughs> and, question again. Uh, That's the answer to the question, where will people who went to Tumblr for yeah, porn go? So does Tumblr what I'm asking is, yeah, does Tumblr still have a business model in people who want to post pictures of cats and cheese? Uh, I think that they obviously feel like they do. I think, like Felicity said, I'm sure it's probably more to do with ad revenue and, and also the money that they no, were no longer getting from Apple taking it down. My real interaction with Tumblr was I've never had an account... I don't know why I'm going around this in such a long way. But um, I think my interaction with Tumblr was a lot of people posting those like inspirational quote things and then a lot of people posting like very quite emotional quotes on the backgrounds of images of people in like desperation and stuff as a, in a kind of emo teen way. I think it's very popular among movie fans and people who have fandom accounts. So people who put fanfic up and they do a lot of drawings. I still think it's very popular among them, but there's no doubt that Tumblr's going to lose a fair amount of people over this. It was also very popular among sex workers, wasn't it? Because I think there have been quite a few headlines this week with sex workers saying, you know, this was one of the few safe places where we could kind of operate and now it's going to make it a lot harder for us. They think, so sex workers think, believe that it was because of a anti-trafficking law that was passed in the US called STA Mm. that was like hyper zealous, like wanting to remove all. And Mm. then Tumblr reacted very zealously wanting to remove any kind of hint of sex work, even if it didn't involve trafficking at all. But And so people thought that might have a, a kind of a connection with that. But from a tech point of view, Cameron, mm. Tumblr stepped in when it was difficult for people to create their own blogs on other platforms by giving them a nice, easy template where they could share stuff. Yeah. It is easier now, isn't it? Most people can work out how to design a website fairly easily using templates and stuff anyway, and other social networks do still allow porn. It's completely true. I think with... Something like Tumblr, it was just one of those systems that was very straightforward to do. Uh, yes, while there are other places to go, WordPress is apparently a really popular one to to go if you want to start your own blog up in this style. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Tumblr was one of the most easiest ones. You know, you could just go there, you could post it up, and you really w- did have to look for that kind of content if you wanted to find it. If you went onto Tumblr's website and typed anything in that you would want to, you would only get relatively speaking, clean images. So I think Tumblr really did have its have its own hand on, on the market. And, you know, it's not going anywhere. A lot of people are kind of talking about that it's it's the end of, end of time for Tumblr, which it's not. I just don't think many people will be going back to it. Jamie, you're next. What do you think this week will be remembered for? It's Christmas, so inevitably there's problems with Brussels. Well, most votes uh, to, well, more um, draft, dras- drastic parties, uh, for instance, the NVA, which are the uh, separatists Flemish, uh, have decided to, to leave the federal government in order uh, to have better scores, to, to attract more uh, right-wing votes in May. They decided to uh, go against this Marrakesh Pact, this uh, UN Pact on Migration. That was Belgian MP Charles Michel on News Channel France 24. Jamie, why is this your story of the week? So there has been a vote of no confidence in a prime minister that's not in our country. (laughs) So we're all okay. It was in Belgium this week. The vote of no confidence passed. And Charles Michel, who was the prime minister, who was running a coalition, has, well... We're not sure, but we think he probably will continue to be caretaker prime minister, a bit like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer at Manchester United, until the elections in May. But the reason that it came, that it happened was the pro-Flemish party that he was in a coalition with decided to pull out of the coalition because of Belgium signing up to the UN Global Migration Pact. And why is the UN Migration Pact so controversial. I mean, by its definition, you'd think this is countries coming together to remove any feelings of national irresponsibility around the issue. Good question, Ollie. Thanks. Yeah, it's a legally binding pact 
signed by UN countries in the UN. Initially, it was only the US that refused to sign it. But when it came to the point at which they were actually signing it, 10 countries didn't, mainly from Eastern Europe run by um, nationalist governments. So it's like Austria, Hungary, uh, Hungary those yeah, guys. Those guys. Okay, um, so, and so there's a similar divide in Belgium, is there? There's a, a, so the, a far right. Yeah, so the elements. Flemish, the Flemish, they wouldn't describe themselves as far right, but they, they never are, do. <laughs> they are the right wing party that has opposed the pact and said that actually what it'll do is encourage and aid migration, whereas it, which is just inaccurate. It's just not true. The the idea of that it's been kind of heralded by Merkel and others saying that actually the idea is just to be nice to. It's basically saying you've got to be nice to people to migrants and and immigrants in in the country. Okay, so Felicity, it's not just the parallel with the vote of no confidence in the prime minister, is it? Then it's the fact that migration is an issue clearly for many many countries in Europe that isn't resolved, just like here. It's still an ongoing debate. Yeah, I feel less embarrassed about the whole situation in this country right now. I'm so glad we sort of turned the attention onto uh, <laughs> Belgium. But no, I think it's true. I think migration is just basically tearing apart Europe and other countries. And I suppose it's a sign of how completely ineffective the EU has been in, in dealing with the migration problem. And it's only going to get worse. And I think the whole point of this pact was to try and solve the, the crisis that is going to be a lot bigger in the future with more and more people trying to get into By Europe. doing what? So what's in the pact? It's 23 stated objectives, which include making legal migration easier. And I guess that's one of the objections from these, these countries, the idea that it's sort of chipping away at sovereign power of individual governments and that it's going to lead to an increase in immigration. But what's kind of mad is that a lot of objectives, you, I can't see why any country would possibly disagree with them. So one of the main objectives is to examine and minimise why people are leaving their home countries in the first place, which is surely what everyone ideally wants is, is to make it so that these desperate people in many situations who are fleeing their countries don't actually have to do that. And also sort of boosting international efforts to save migrants' lives and to try and share the burden between countries, which thus far the EU has been terrible about. So it it is kind of bonkers that more countries can't get on on board with it. But in Brussels, I mean, thousands of people have demonstrated against this. I mean, it's a huge, huge problem. And what's motivating them? I think it's the fear that it will lead to an increase in immigration. And you have to remember that Belgium does not have a happy history with immigration at all. It was once a very cruel, evil colonial power. And I guess there's still a bit of a hangover from that. Maybe it hasn't really been very good at welcoming migrants. Integration has always been poor. You've got a lot of marginalised communities, terror terror attacks. It's also worth pointing out just about what's motivating the Flemish is that they have, ever since they've gone into the coalition, lost voters in the most recent local elections, they dropped quite in quite a huge percentage. So there is a feeling that they're using the migration pact as a kind of um, cover, almost. And tech correspondent, is this, as ever, somewhat to do with social media? Are people using the internet to stir up tensions around this? Yes, uh, so there, there has been, basically, the, the political party has been sharing images that are somewhat controversial and have come under fire. Uh, I think one of them is depicting uh, uh, women in burqas, going around, but they've gained a lot of traction. So it's sort of not dissimilar, really, to the Leave campaign saying Turkey was going to join the EU at any moment and and pictures of migrants spilling over. It's just typical scaremongering, really. And it's getting an an image like that to really draw up up the passion of of that side of the the argument. But I was just going to touch upon, I think, one of the, uh, the big fears that is being mounted by this move is the the fear that increasing migration will have an impact on Belgium's culture which I just find really kind of ironic because obviously they're part of the EU. Loads of people from all over the EU can go into Belgium and Belgium still has its own identity. I don't see how this would change any of that. Really? I mean, actually, on that point, I do have some sympathy. And yes, it's true. Of course, Brussels is the EU, isn't it? The culture is the EU. But really, that is a white culture, isn't it? Of course, they represent people of lots of diverse different nations. But actually, if you lived and worked in Brussels, and all your life was about trying to consolidate traditions from across France and Germany and Italy, the idea that, you know, you are potentially opening the doors to many more people from Arabia, from Africa and everything else, you can understand why people might think, well, that is a, it's, an, it's another whole problem we're chucking at ourselves. It's a- Surely there are lots of people from, again, across Africa and Arabia that are in other parts of Europe that are right next door to Belgium, particularly France. Surely they can... Uh, travel between the two countries and there's there's no issue there. I, I don't see what, what the problem would and be. It's an, and, you know, Belgium has fundamentally been very bad at integrating immigrants into the country. You know, as Felicity was saying, it's a, a big part of the makeup of the country is is immigrant and it, and it still hasn't worked out how to deal with, you know, and like something, I think it's like 
70 percent of all immigrant women in belgium are unemployed which is nuts when you think about it as a statistic i also think that to touch on a kind of bugbear of mine i think that what we really do need in the future and i think this is probably why it's such a big thing about the global migration thing is this idea of whether or not we accept that borders are an okay thing at all well how would that work then how would a country you'd be able to say this is our sovereign land it would have to go hand in hand with the dissolution of nation states eventually. <laughs> right, okay, it was quite a big proposal, that one. But I think that the idea of having borders is accepting that some people are deserving of our private property, of our public health care, of all of these things. And the fact that you can say, particularly from outside the EU, that, you, that we're going to deny you these things based purely on the luck of where you're born... So this just isn't realistic. When you look at where we are right now with the EU, just to say to get rid of, I mean, to get rid of all borders, we even this global policy UN thing, which is, isn't is legally binding and is really, really nice and generous and no one really should have a problem, even that has seen thousands of protesters. And also I think immigration is a problem and it is, you know, it's not like people who have a problem with immigration are just talking nonsense. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying No, you're creating a radical manifesto for the dissolution of all borders. I I would give a more prosaic response to it, which is like, you're buying a house. Like, how do you ensure that you're buying it using the the laws of the country that it's in? You're talking about getting rid of nation states or like getting rid of the... Well, if you don't say this is the area where these laws apply... But that's the idea is that you want to have much, much hyper... From my perspective, at least, I want much more localised and much more uh, of democracies at a much smaller base. you have local borders, but not national borders. No, you wouldn't because you'd be allowed to let people in and out because there would be free movement How do you literally say this is where London is and this is where Kent starts if there aren't borders at all? Because if it's very small base, if it's only like 150, 200 people and you're talking about just communities, then it doesn't matter where London starts and where Kent starts. So you basically have small blocks of 100 people, of people neighbourhood, yeah, neighbourhoods. Yeah, that, that were deciding about the things that affected them. And then also, if they want to, joining up together a la the I can't EU believe you've there. used Belgium as a Trojan horse for this absolute <laughs> madcap theory. Can we just try and rein this back to migration? And actually, I mean, Belgium in itself is a slightly odd way of looking at the problem because the US is the biggest country of all that's opted out of yeah. this UN agreement, isn't yeah. it? That's much more significant, really, isn't it, with respect to Belgian listeners than what's going on in Belgium? <laughs> yes, and I think that the I think that what's happening in Belgium you know, these people are co-opting the migration problem that people are protesting against and getting people against in order to increase the support for nationalism that we know is occurring across the world. You know, in the US it's happening, you know, Steve Bannon and all of those people are trying to drum up support for nation- for kind of national identity and nationalism. And I think that these elections in May could be very interesting and very important if the right wing do end up surging it off the back of what's happened with the Migration Pact and using that as a springboard for that. The elections in Belgium? In Belgium, yeah. yeah, yeah. You think that could have a trickle-down effect in the same way arguably Brexit did on the US election? Yes, I think that if they use the criticisms of the Migration Pact as a springboard to gain support, it will be a kind of test case for future, for people like Steve Bannon and for future, to show that you can win right-wing support across Europe, which, I mean, they they clearly do want to do. What's so scary about this is that... There is no effective government. It has literally brought a whole country's government to its knees. And it was the whole point of Michelle going into this coalition government was to keep it was to avoid a political paralysis. And remembering that in 2010, the country was left without a federal government for 541 days, which at the time was a world record. You're seeing the same thing in Sweden. Sweden hasn't had a government for months. And that's the same thing. It's because none of the parties want to work with the Sweden Democrats who are far right. So you're definitely seeing the far right having such an effect on governments that they can't function. And it's better to be on the outside for them. Like they don't want to be part of government because yeah. because the way that they can drum up support and get protest. is, that, is, yeah, is yeah. they can't protest if they're part of the government. Well, maybe that will see the uh, dissolution of all borders in the end, James, yes. that all governments fall. Yes. And finally this week, Felicity, what do you think this week will be remembered for? The race is on across the polar plateau, but have we reached the peak of human endeavour? I carry this rock with me every day. It's a small rock from the summit of Mount Everest. This rock stands for the moment I chose to keep pushing forward. This rock stands for my untapped potential. As I set new goals and ultimately encounter obstacles, this rock reminds me that even Mount Everest can be broken down to its smallest parts. A bunch of small rocks stacked on top of each other. Many steps, 
leading to the summit. That was explorer Colin O'Brady at a TEDx talk in July last year. You can see the full talk at uh, TED.com. Uh, Felicity, what's going on here? Well, at the bottom of the earth right now, two men are simultaneously attempting to become the first person to cross Antarctica alone and unsupported. You've got the British explorer Lou Rudd, who's 49, British Army captain, and an American professional athlete, 33-year-old Colin O'Brady, who is currently in front of him by about 29 miles. First people to do it unsupported. Yes. So it's been done with teams before. It's been done with teams before. They're um, literally alone? No support, really? Literally alone, no support. So they've both got skis carrying 140 kilograms through the snow. The journey began last month. It has been done before. So earlier this year, the British Army's Ice Maidens, a group of women, managed to do the route in 26 days but of course Captain Rudd believes he can do better than this so they're battling 60 mile per hour winds and treacherous landscapes to to achieve this incredible feat why have you chosen the story is it because you genuinely think it will be an incredible feat because it sounded to me like you had a tone of cynicism there (laughs) I, I really really do I think it's I think when you actually read into it and look at what they're doing and what they have to what they have to get past, both sort of physically and psychologically, it is really, really amazing. And I think it is very easy to sort of say, I mean, there have been opinion pieces generated, sort of what's the point? Why are people doing this? This is just a sort of like macho alpha. I've got to, you know, be the best and, and see like how far I can push the limits of whatever. But actually, when you when you read what they're actually doing, it is pretty, pretty incredible. And it's even things, I think like the sort of psychological things that, you know, Christmas, they will be sending it completely cold, completely alone. They've now both passed the actual South Pole. And when they were there, it meant they couldn't actually meet the researchers who are currently there and go inside and talk to them because that would render the whole mission void because it would mean that they were it was no longer unsupported. And but- I think it also kind of harps back to the idea that now we're going back to this very kind of like severe, harsh methods of endeavour and exploration where you can't talk to anyone, you can't have any contact with the outside of the world, you have to be completely alone in in what you're doing. It's preparing us for Brexit though, isn't it, really? (laughs) (laughs) Is there a legitimacy to it, Cameron, that it is more worthwhile, more impressive, more record worthy if you're doing it alone? If you're deliberately making it difficult for yourself. I find this funny, particularly the argument of where they say, oh, it's just being macho to go and walk to the South Pole by yourself. But surely is it it will be a huge achievement to get there by yourself, to wander across these in horrendously cold temperatures and then climb up a glacier. Yeah, I, I just think that's such a fantastic... Well, I, mean, I, I would personally not do it. I find getting up the stairs at Goode Street Station a challenge. But for someone to go out and, and do that, I don't know why people would complain about it. It's, it's just such a fantastic story. Jamie, you'll probably complain about it. <laughs> of course you will. Pointless. It is. Do you think it's pointless? Uh, no, actually, uh, to be fair, I think so. There's a there's a personal element to the British guy that's doing it as well, which is that one of his like really good friends died while attempting the the feat. So he was his friend tried to do it two years ago and died during it. I mean, I'd probably say the most interesting thing are the reactions of the people that are closest to them. There are people out there who are doing things like I, I remember James Cracknell, his wife Beverly Turner, like really struggled with the things that he was doing and the and the position that he was putting her in. Mm. And I wonder like really how compassionate you are if this is what you spend your life doing when you have kids and family. And and I think that in that in those scenarios, when you are putting people put putting other people on the on the edge, I kind of shudder at the thought of it but I also understand that yeah I mean it is an amazing achievement and like and I imagine that the clarity of mind and the like the epiphanies you get while you're walking on your own and, and the ability to if you can think about anything at all yeah I mean um, I clear my head in a 20 minute walk to the news agent perfect yeah. personally but I, I can see that but Felicity the thing that Jamie seems to be getting at it seems to me is also about sort of the fact that both these men come from the developed world mm. and are opting into this incredible challenge mm. and making life hard for themselves. I mean, people who genuinely have it hard for themselves are the people we were talking about in the last story, aren't they? They're migrants that are trekking across the hottest conditions, nearly drowning in the sea, seeing their friends die before them. That's a genuine journey where people are in peril. This is just like a theme park imitation of it, isn't it? Well, yes. But I, I mean, I think, A, these kind of stories kind of remove us and lift us out of all the doom and gloom of everything else yeah, and also these people aren't aren't forced to you know flee their lands this is people who have exactly. decided to but I, you're opting into something that people deliberately choose not to do 
because we're we're pushing. They the, have a comfortable life. They're from a place where it's not yes, necessary. But, to yeah, do but this that's to why it's so fascinating. Is because they're rejecting. Go with that. a Wi-Fi connection. But they they want to reject <laughs> that. They want to, they want to experience total solitude. They want to get away from everything that's going on in the world. Suppose, which but is, is that a Western entitlement? I suppose that's what I'm getting. Yeah, at. of course. This, this idea of like let's let's of course, see, but it, let's of see, course, but it doesn't make it any. It, like it really doesn't hard. make it any less it, like incredible. And I think it was also fascinating what sort of Jamie was saying about the kind of total breathtaking selfishness of why they do it as well and the impact that it have has on the family and the people that they leave behind who are always wondering whether they're actually going to survive this and it r- reminded me of this documentary that's just come out at the moment which is um, Alex Honnold the US climber who famously got to the top of El Capitan the sort of 3,000 feet high rock monolith in Yosemite National Park last year without any ropes without any help whatsoever which was just the most incredible yeah, there's a movie out about that at the moment yes, isn't there? what's yes. it called Any, uh, anyone remember Free Solo there we go Free it's, Solo it's incredible I see, highly recommend everyone to watch it it's really un, it's, it's un, 50 pound for a babysitter it's still worth un, it? it yeah it's unbelievable what <laughs> okay. he's done 3,000 feet with no ropes with no nothing yeah. knowing that you know the slightest move and he would die but it's a really interesting documentary because it examines the dynamics between him and his girlfriend who literally has no idea whether he's going to survive this thing and the number of rock climbers even when they do have ropes who die you know this is, it is literally life and death Cameron why do you think this adventurer genre is seeing a revival I think it seems to be a, a lot more accessible now so if we're looking at the trust the tech guy to go over to this look at the kit that the guys are, are taking with them you certainly wouldn't have had explorers taking gps trackers satellite phones and modems with them and while they are doing this completely alone i can't help but think if they got into real trouble there is a way out there's for an emergency line is there there is uh, well yeah i mean having a satellite phone mm. is actually yeah wire. they just get dragged all the way back to <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just, just press a, big a button bungee. and it, yeah, it pulls them back um it is slightly more accessible now and i think it's people are adrenaline hunters and and uh if the option's there for them to go and do it and the opportunity is there then people will go and take that if you are wired in that way you will go and take that yeah. opportunity i think that's the big thing is that these people are different. And like over the course of like, they're you know, superhuman. there's 7 billion people out there. People are allowed to be different. And, you know, and like, yes, because these people are so otherworldly different, there's an element of cynicism about why don't you just, yeah, go for a walk and clear your head that way. But, you know, these are people that are pushing themselves to a point where they can't be. And yeah. that's fine. It's you know. very similar to what a sportsman would experience. So... I'm going to bring this back to cars now. Um, if you if you take it if you take someone like a Formula One driver, right, you are constantly or a MotoGP rider on a motorbike, you are constantly on the edge of life and death. But you are doing it to compete. You are doing it to be the number one. And they simply they say they don't care. But this is a whole this is a whole other level because in the Alex Honnold documentary, one of the film crew likens it to what what he's doing is it's like going for gold medal at the Olympics. But if he doesn't get gold, he will die. Mm-hmm. It is it is that crazy. And I think also the reason why I chose it as my story of the week is that it raises really really massive questions about what life is all about. Anyway, in a way, there was this great quote by Brett Stevens in in the New York Times. He said it raises questions like, "Should long life be a goal of life? What about happiness? If not happiness, what about excellence? If excellence, what if anything should we sacrifice in its pursuit? Love and when does the pursuit of excellence become more mere recklessness?" What is the most daring thing you've ever done? I want to finish every, on that. Ever? Yeah, genuinely. Like, have you ever done anything adventure Yeah, done rock climbing. Surely Scarfell Pike at junior school or something. Uh, yeah, I, well, so when I was a bit, a bit younger, I used to be quite a portly child and I had to go, I, I basically ate all of my lunch early when we were doing a walk mm. and, and I had to go what was effectively like six or seven hours without um, food and that was probably about as close as I got to Alex Honnold. And that is what it's all about, isn't it? Uh, Cameron? Oh God, this is going to sound really, really quite lame, but I think, you know, I love driving cars fast for work. I think that's probably the closest I get to <laughs> any form of danger. And that, driving that, a car to work is that not is, adventure. Oh, no, no, no. I just test, test I them can beat that for work, testing them on racetracks and things like that. But okay. I mean, that's really saying something of where that's the most dangerous thing I can do. I, I live quite a sedate lifestyle. You do got the stairs at Goose Street, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, only when lethal, I though. only when I have to, and they are <laughs> lethal. Felicity, I once really badly damaged my leg doing some sand surfing nice i don't even know what sand surfing is but that sounds like, like an adventure sport surfing in the sand that's but, cool. <laughs> like yeah the sand isn't like a wave is it how do you 
you have a board, board yeah. and you have crazy high sand dunes. Oh, like hills sort of, that you sort of yeah. write. It's yeah. like sledging, yeah. but on sand. Sledging, sla- that's what it should be called. Sand, it should be called sand, sand, sand sledging. sledging sand yeah, sledging. that's what we should call what it. Was your, what's your one then? Yeah, come on, Ollie. I climbed Everest, but you know, you didn't think to ask. Uh, that is it <laughs> from this edition of The Week Unwrapped. My thanks to Cameron Tate, Jamie Timpson and Felicity Capon. And indeed to our sponsor, Barclays Corporate Banking, whose industry experts can help your business. Find out more at barclayscorporate.com slash the week never miss an episode of the show when you subscribe just search for the week unwrapped on your app of choice and hit subscribe and don't forget our christmas offer if you use the code pod xmas at the checkout you can get up to 43 percent off a subscription to the print magazine that's at dennismags.co.uk slash the week i've been ollie man our music is by tom morby the producer chica airs at rethink audio until we meet again for our year in review special bye-bye